Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the award-winning Texas history podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise. Thank you for tuning into this very special episode to hear some Texas history. A while back, I mentioned to you that I was going to do my best to do some interviews with interesting folks around Texas. This episode is an interview with author Stephen Harrigan. Stephen Harrigan was born in Oklahoma City, but got to Texas as soon as he could, which was when he was five years old. He grew up in Abilene and Corpus Christi. He's a longtime writer-at-large for Texas Monthly, and his articles and essays have appeared in a wide range of other publications, including The Atlantic, The Wall Street Journal, and National Geographic, among many others. He's written 11 books of both fiction and nonfiction, including The Gates of the Alamo, a well-known Texas uh, work of Texas historical fiction, It was a New York Times bestseller. It received a number of awards, including the Spur Award for Best Novel of the West. Another novel of his, Remembering Ben Clayton, also won the Spur Award. Harrigan writes for television and screenplays for the movies. His award-winning screenplays have been produced on such outlets as HBO, TNT, the Hallmark Channel. He's even working on a project with author Elizabeth Crook and actor-producer Robert Duvall. Steve is the recipient of the Texas Book Festival's Writer's Award, the Lon Tinkle Award for Lifetime Achievement, which is awarded by the Texas Institute of Letters. He's won the Texas Medal of Arts Award from the Texas Cultural Trust and is a member of the Texas Literary Hall of Fame. I sat down with Steve in Austin on the afternoon of the launch of his newest book, Big Wonderful Thing, which took took place at the Bullock State History Museum. Big Wonderful Thing is a sweeping narrative history of Texas. We talked about how this project came about, how he did his research, and what it's like for a journalist and novelist to write a history book. We also discussed the importance of Texas history and much, much more. So please enjoy this interview with award-winning author Stephen Harrigan as we discuss his new history of Texas big, wonderful thing. Steve, thank you so much for joining Wise About Texas today. Great to be here, Ken. Thank you. Well, uh, we are a few few short hours from the launch of your new book, Big Wonderful Thing. Uh, We're sitting in Austin, Texas, and uh, we're going to launch it at the Bullock Museum tonight, and it's my understanding you're being interviewed with by Dan Rather on stage, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So what, I guess the first question is, what is more nerve-wracking, getting interviewed by a judge, <laughs> podcaster, or Dan Rather on stage? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question. I, I don't know what you're going to pull out of your hat in, in a legal way. <laughs> <laughs> so well, hopefully just... <laughs> nothing. I've done a thorough background, and you appear to have lived okay. a good life. So we're, um, tell us how it feels to launch a book when you and you've launched several uh, that have turned out to be award-winning as I'm sure this one will be what uh, what does it feel like do you, do you well launch is a strange word for a book because uh, you know there's an official publication date and people talk about that as the launch or the or the maybe the party or the the event you have on that day but it's not like the world changes. <laughs> you know, it's not like the world stops. Uh, it's, uh, it's it's another day where you have a, you know, and you're you look forward to it because the book is out and people can read it. But that doesn't mean everybody's going to rush out and read it. I mean, it, a book is a kind of stealth uh, object. You know, it sort of s- slips into the bloodstream if you're lucky, and in, into the conversation, and you know that's what you hope. You hope that the book will not be ignored, that it will be read, that people will talk about it, argue about it, you know, come up with their own versions of how they would have done a history of Texas. <laughs> and uh, I think there, I think that, I think Texas is, as a state, as an idea, is a powerful entity. <laughs> and so I feel like people want to grapple with this book. Uh, you know, no matter who wrote it, they want to they want to hear what you have to say about Texas, what you think about Texas, what your interpretation of you know these thousands of events that have created Texas are. Well, you can bet there's nothing that we Texans like better than arguing about the stories of <laughs> Texas, and this book is full of stories. It is uh, 900 plus pages, 
and uh, I, I took the liberty of weighing it, oh, and, it and it came in over five pounds, and I've been carrying it around for a month. I can tell you it's substantive, mm -hmm. um, and having read it, most of it at this point, uh, has a lot, a lot to it. Um, how did it come about? How did it come about that you, Steve Harrigan, wrote a history of the entire state of Texas? Well, it, to begin with, I have to admit it wasn't my idea. It was the idea of Dave Hamrick, at, at the director of, of the University of Texas Press. And he foresaw the need for a, a new Texas history, a, a new sort of soup to nuts Texas history. It had been 50 years or so since the classic uh, T.R. Fehrenbach book, Lone Star, came out. And there have been several very good Texas histories since then by, by James Haley and by Randolph Campbell and others. But there wasn't, uh, Dave felt that there wasn't a big enough, long enough, uh, you know, book that, that, that would sort of fill that need. He, he, he felt that there was a, an audience for it. And he had to convince me because I wasn't, I, I wasn't sure that I was the person to do this. And uh, it took me a, a lot of head scratching and a lot of kind of saying no and coming back and saying, well, maybe uh, before I finally agreed to do it. So why did you say yes? Because I finally couldn't stop myself. Uh, I, in the book, I talk about how, in a kind of afterward or acknowledgments, I talk about how if I were like a painter and somebody had come to me with a giant canvas, a giant blank canvas, 100 feet long, and handed me a brush and said, okay, paint. <laughs> what kind of painter would I be if I didn't want to to try to attack that canvas? And that, that became the same feeling I had with, with, this, with this book, with this proposed book. Plus I felt, I felt like I could do it. I've, I have lived in Texas almost all my life. Uh, I've written about Texas my whole career. And without me quite realizing it, I had become not a professional historian or not an academic historian, but, a, but an enthusiastic writer of history. And also I had lived through a lot of Texas history. Um, you, know, a lot, you know, this book takes us up to more or less the present moment. And, you know, I've seen, seen some of that firsthand. I mean, not necessarily the grand events, but I've, I've, I've been alive during those, those times. And I felt like I had something to contribute and something to say. How does, uh, you mentioned being alive for many of the events in the book, how does it differ when you're writing about those events? Do you have to fight against present sense impressions uh, versus research-based writing, or how does that work for you? Well, it's a tricky, tricky thing because, uh, you know, you feel freer writing about the past in a way because, uh, not that it's all settled, but it's there's a there generally is a kind of consensus that has built up about distant events, whereas more recent events, you know, well, for instance, the Kennedy assassination. I mean, uh, I I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't buy into any of the of the Oswald didn't act alone scenarios, but boy, is that a turbulent field of study, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you have to. Uh, you have to be aware of all the all the various opinions and interpretations that are that are ongoing all the time about almost anything you write about. Were you? How long did this take you? This whole project, by the way. It took about six years to write this book. That's a good long time. It Where was do a good you? long time. I have grandchildren <laughs> well, who weren't born when I was <laughs> when I began. Well, you have uh, you talked about the hundred foot canvas canvas and the paintbrush that UT Press provided you. Where did you start? Starting is the tricky part. <laughs> you know, when you're when you're writing a book that you know is going to encompass 500 years of history and you know 15,000 years of prehistory a little bit, uh, it's intimidating. You know, you have to uh, you have to look for a place where you feel comfortable beginning. And for me. You know, since I've been a journalist all my life and a novelist, I'm I'm looking for those moments that that I feel like I can write well about. 
Uh, and I decided that I would begin the book with big text burning down at the Texas State <laughs> Fair. I don't know why at first. Uh, it just felt like, oh, this would be fun to write about. And it was a way to alert the reader to the fact that, you know, this book begins in a way that's inviting, that's friendly, that's contemporary, and that harkens back to a time when we as Texans thought we had been there and done that. <laughs> Texas thought it had solved its, its problems, it had, it had sort of codified its personality and its identity. And I was intrigued by that moment in history, almost as much as any moment in the book. You know, in 1936, uh, when, when uh, you know, Texas threw this gigantic centennial party for itself on, on the 100th anniversary of its, uh, of its independence from Mexico. And Big Tex was not part of that party, but he, he was a fixture at the state fairgrounds in Dallas where that party was thrown. And I just, I, all these things together, this, this sense of this kind of cowboy identity <laughs> that Texas adopted for itself in 1936 and that has perpetuated to this day really intrigued me and got me thinking about uh, what Texas is and what Texas means. So what do you think that's going to look like in 2036 at our 200th? Who knows? Uh, least of all me. You know, <laughs> one of the things I've discovered about being a historian, you may have discovered this yourself, is that people expect you to predict the future. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and wait, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't know anything more than Didn't you sign do. up for the future. <laughs> right. Um, well, you... You've talked around the idea that you're not a historian, although I would contest that to some degree. You're certainly a novelist and a journalist of, of large renown. How do you approach a history book when you're a novelist or a journalist? Well, I approach it. Uh, I approach a history book with the same sort of guiding tenets that I approach uh, a magazine article or a or a novel or a screenplay sometimes when I write screenplays for movies, which is that I want it to be fun to read. I mean, that's my primary concern. I want a reader to feel entertained, to feel uh, like, like he or she can keep turning the pages, that there's, uh, there's fun stuff to read ahead. That doesn't mean I don't take the, the job of, of, of gathering these facts and trying to sort them out and portray them accurately as a, in a very serious way but I wanted the book to be light-hearted uh, I, I I wanted it to read in some ways like a magazine article uh, where you always you always make an attempt when you're writing an article to to grab the reader's attention and then and then tell the reader what needs to be told but but if you can't if you can't get their attention at the beginning, you know, it's hopeless. Nobody's going to stay with you. So how do you do that when you're dealing with historical events that have actually happened? Mm -hmm. and, and I know for me at least, it's very tempting to go from the, fir the beginning to the end. But that right. doesn't necessarily grab you all the time. Not all so. the time. I mean, it's, it, it was certainly a, my, my uh, goal to tell the story of Texas from the beginning to the end and not to confuse the reader in terms of where where we were chronologically. But I knew that with every chapter, I had to sort of earn the reader's trust all over again. Uh, so I, it wasn't enough just to say, and then this happened after that. I had to, to, uh, to portray the personalities, the, the sense of, uh, the, you know, the lived experience of people, uh, the, the tone and texture of the times. I, I want those to be sort of foregrounded every time I, I engaged again with, with, with a new chapter. And so sometimes chapters start with a quotation from someone that I found interesting. Sometimes they, uh, they'll start with action that may, uh, that may, you know, somebody else might have just led up to that action in a very steady way. But I, I think it's more interesting to if there's a duel or a battle or a, or a conflict to sort of maybe begin there and, and 
tell the reader how that happened. But but again, trying to keep trying to keep that sense of, of excitement simmering. You mentioned conflict in, in, in the context of excitement. I mean, Texas has had conflict its whole existence, it mm-hmm. seems. What, how do you think that defines us as a state, or does it? Well, I've thought about this a good bit. I mean, uh, Texas is bigger than any other state except Alaska, as we know. Well, until the ice melts, I would say. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, so there's more stuff that happens here. And uh, we have a, a long, contentious border with Mexico. We have a, uh, we, uh, if I can use the word we, as, as, a, as a state or as a nation before that, or as a province, the state of Mexico before mm-hmm. that, have had a uh, tense relationship with distant federal governments. Right. So there has been, uh, whether it's unique, whether Texas is unique or not among uh, among the other 49 states in the country, it's hard to say, but it's bigger and it encompasses more conflict. And because of its size and because of, of where it sits, uh, it it conflicts just keep brewing, brewing in this place. And now they're not so much armed conflicts anymore, but they're ideological conflicts, you know, that just keep popping up again and again. Why do you think that is, besides scope and scale? Is there something about the people that are attracted to Texas or what it takes to live here that causes that? What do you think? I think uh, I think there is such a thing as a Texas identity that changes over time, gets you know modified by different immigrant groups or different different people moving here from different parts of the country and the world. But there is this uh, sense of tech that Texas has of wanting to be its own thing. And I think that that has to do, you know, I'm not the first person to observe it. It has to do with the fact that we were an independent republic for, for you know, for 10 years. And uh, during that time, Texas was an independent republic. It was in constant conflict. It was fighting off reinvasions from Mexico. It was fighting, you know, wars on its frontier against Native Americans. And, uh, you know, there's a, I think conflict helps forge an identity. And after, after Texas joined the Union, supposedly became part of the national identity, it wasn't too long before it seceded. We from left the right now. Yeah, we left again. <laughs> yeah, and then in a way, it 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 seceded from the defeated Confederacy. Yeah. You know, it it sort of positioned itself as as not uh, you know not a, an emblem of the lost cause of the Civil War, but more of its own its own thing, more of a of a of a sort of Western state than a Southern state. So it's there's a constant uh, internal conversation that Texans have, I think, about what is a Texan? And, you know, nobody can quite define it, but it feels somewhat distinct. You know, I think everybody wants a piece of that identity, whether you're, whether you're in opposition to it or not. You know, uh, you, wa- you don't want to be not called a Texan. Uh, you know, and I think that's true of... Uh, that's true of every every sort of ethnic group, or or uh, you know, all you know, this diverse culture we have. It's I'm not talking about Tex. When I say Texan, I don't mean like Anglo Texans. I mean mm-hmm. the the kind of somewhat agreed upon idea that there is a place called Texas, and that there is a kind of ethos that Texans share. Is that the spirit of Texas that we talk about a lot? Probably, I mean that that kind of independence, that kind of self-reliance. That you know, I mean, that's not me. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. The, I don't feel like I'm a uh, a, a cowboy personality. Uh, and yet, if somebody tells comes up to me and tells me you're not really a Texan, I'm I might take issue with that. Yeah. Yeah. How's that? How how do you, having just written hundreds of pages about this? How have you seen that evolve over time? What does it look like in in eighteen 
30 versus 1930? Well, it's... Uh, As times change, I guess. Times of, you know, I mean, 1830, well, for one thing, Texas was Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so Texas, uh, you know, its, its identity was, uh, you know, well, almost ex except for Native Americans, it was almost exclusively Mexican. And the Anglo colonists who were here had somewhat more or less agreed to become Mexican citizens. Um, that, of course, was all turned on its head by the Texas Revolution. Um, Texas became, uh, you know, an important uh, leading indicator of, of the conflict that was to come, the Civil War, because it was very much a slave state and depended, you know, Im Im immensely upon slave labor to, to make the, the econ its economy work. So, I mean, you could, you know, there's a whole range of, uh, of uh, ways in which you could chart the, how that Texas identity grew and changed and was subverted. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's just, it's an ongoing, continuing story, but I think there is, at the core of it, there is this ongoing, continuing question of Texanness, you know, and in a way that might not quite be true of other states. So I, um, I think about, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, okay, Texas was successful in a revolution. We were successful in maintaining ourselves as a republic. We can argue about whether it was yeah, a successful that's, that's time arguable. period. Right. But we at least hung in there until annexation mm -hmm. to the United States, or entry into the United States. And then as times have changed, we got through the Civil War, through uh, an economy that depended on slavery, and then all of a sudden didn't have it. Uh, we invented semiconductors, started the oil business, put men on the moon from mm -hmm. here. So have, do you think we've maintained that spirit and if we have, how do we keep doing that? In your observation, well, I don't. I think we've maintained it. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, Tex. I think dynamism, the dynamism of Texas in all sorts of ways: culture, music, literature, business, of course. Uh, all those things create. Uh, you know, this, this ongoing identity. Now, how do we, I think the way we lose that identity or lose that spirit you're talking about is to, um, I mean, there are probably several ways. One of, one of them is to turn too far inward, you know, to, to become too self-absorbed, to, be, to turn our back on the rest of the world and to maybe the rest of the country. Another way is to, um, you know, just give up. <laughs> you know, in terms of uh, uh, what we expect of ourselves. Do you think our history, how important is it to have that history as a basis when we're thinking about being Texan and preserving that spirit? I think that's, without that history, there would be no basis. There would be no, there would be no conversation about being a Texan if we didn't have that history. So the history is unique, really. I mean, I think so. I, I think so. I mean, you know, there's a big argument to be made about whether Texas is different than any other place. Uh, you know, people joke about how nobody calls themselves a Nebraskan or something like that, or an <laughs> Iowan or whatever. But you know, I mean, people in Nebraska and in Iowa have a history. Right. They have. They have. They're <laughs> they proud. do. What? <laughs> and and uh, they, you know, we. Sh we, we, I think we can be way too self-absorbed sometimes. I think we can be way too chauvinistic sometimes. But I think if we look at our history objectively, I, I think it's pretty compelling. You know, it's, uh, I mean, there are plenty of places in the country that have totally absorbing historical events. New England, for instance, or, uh, you know, look at everything that happened there. Uh, but I think that uh, that Texas is is cohesive because it's one big place. You know, after 1850, right. when, when we when we sort of finally settled our borders, it's it's one one giant region that is made up of all sorts of geographies. You know, 
forests, plains, prairies, sea coasts, deserts, mountains, all that sort of comes together in Texas. And even though those things are, you know, could be considered mutually exclusive as, as territories or as, as geographical zones, somehow they're mutually supportive and, yeah. they, and they combine to create uh, a Texas consciousness. Well, what about that history were some of your favorites as you went through this book? What are your favorite stories? I loved, uh, I loved reading about and writing about people I hadn't really thought about before. Uh, one of them was uh, Sister Maria Jose de Agreda, or Jesus, excuse me, Sister Maria Jesus de Agreda, who was this Spanish nun, a, a, a cloistered nun in Spain, who never left her convent her whole life, but who claimed in the early part of the 17th century that she had been in two places at once. <laughs> and one of the places she had been was Texas, where she, uh, where the Lord had told her to preach to the Indians there and ask them to uh, go, to trek across West Texas to go to the friars who were, you know, Franciscan friars who were living around the uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe and ask them to come create missions in Texas. And boy, was that weird. <laughs> you know, and uh, <laughs> and yet, you know, there was there was a, here's this woman here's this woman way in distant Spain, never set foot in Texas, who had an effect on Texas history, and there were uh, and there, there was some claim by the Indi that the Indians told the Franciscans that they had seen a lady in blue. Lady in blue that, is what they called her. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you know they they were. You know, they probably had their own agenda. <laughs> you know, they could they could use a little uh, protection. Right. You know, from from the Apaches and. Okay, people. well, I got it. I got to ask you. I had uh, when you write about that in the book, you mention in a separate place that there's a record that she handed them a chili recipe. Yes. In the <laughs> they handed the Indians a chili recipe. Right. You got it. Can you come clean on where you found that? Or? I'm. I'm. I was hoping you would not. Hold my feet That's to the okay. fire. The fact but is, I, but I think it's in the book. It's they, in the right now, but it's not just in the book. I found, I read it somewhere, <laughs> <laughs> and I think it may have been in. Uh, I was writing about Everett de Gallier, who right, was right. Uh, one of the great uh, Chile scholars, as well as yes. uh, you know, one of the early, you know, important character in, in the oil exploration, and and uh, and had had a a, a, a hand in in, make, in creating, uh, you know. Uh, well, in in discovering Middle Eastern oil to right. some degree, and I, it may have been it was in reading about him, and in maybe it may have been something he even wrote, and you know I don't okay I'm not well I'm I, not I, saying absolutely with with absolute conviction that that this by locating Spanish nun gave <laughs> Texas its first chili recipe, but I couldn't resist mentioning it. But you will you will of course. Uh, be firm in the fact that that chili recipe did not contain beans. Oh, of course not. Okay, no. good. Well, I've done the Chili Queens of San Antonio on the podcast. I've yet to do the Lady in Blue, uh, but we are definitely going to combine those. That was a great story. And um, so let's talk a little bit about research. How, you know, you've done some great research on other of your novels that were based in Texas. Well, all your novels, but the ones that your historical novels. But the ones from Texas that stick out to me are Gates of the Alamo, of course, and Remembering Ben Clayton, one of the most gripping fiction books I've ever read. Oh, but, and they were very well researched. But this is a history book, right. quote unquote. So how did you do research for this? Well, I, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say that I did it any one particular way. Uh, a lot of it, of course, was reading. Some of it was archival research, but a lot of it was reading uh, other histories, looking in the notes of those of those history books, looking for, uh, you know, where the sources came from, and then going to those sources and getting as close as I could to firsthand accounts, uh, because that's those are the accounts that are usually the most trustworthy. And uh, a lot of it, a lot of the research was 
I wouldn't even call it research, I would call it exploring, which would be you know, getting in my car, going somewhere, seeing something. Uh, you know, some trace of the old Camino Real or, you know, some mission or some, you know, Caddo Temple Mound and absorbing the fact that they had once been there and then going back to the going back to the history books and the archives and trying to uh, to make that that reality come alive uh, at the time it was happening. So you did a lot of driving. I did a lot of driving. Yeah. Um, and I want to come back to that. Uh, what uh, what do you think, what do you hope that your readers get from this book? Um, what are they going? What do you? What are they going to learn? What do you want them to learn? I don't want them to learn anything, really. I mean, that's just that's not. I'm not a teacher. I'm a writer, and so I feel like my job is to uh, entertain them in a productive way. And uh, I'd like people to feel like they've read this book, had a good time, and haven't wasted their time. And so that's about all I can uh, all I can offer. You know, I don't I don't have a thesis. I don't have an argument. Uh, I, I'm just I'm sort of exploring along with the reader. You know, trying to understand this this place and this history. Entertain in a productive way. I'm going to steal that line for the podcast. Is <laughs> okay. that all right? Sure. Um, are there threads that you found in your research? that run through Texas history that are just as current as they were in their originating time, do you think? Are we dealing with some of the same issues? Well, take something like immigration. You know, uh, about as big an issue as you can, you can get right now. Uh, and when you look back in the, you know, the 1830s, early 1830s, Immigration was a great big issue, except it was a it was flipped. It was Mexico had this problem with right. illegal immigrants, yeah. which were Americans, and that led to you know this gigantic war that tore Mexico, or that was part of what tore Mexico apart, and that that tore Texas away from Mexico. And yet here we are again. We've had this this border with Mexico ever since that time, and. Uh, that has the the tension across that border, but also the harmony across that border. You know that the, the the inter interplay between cultures and the you know the the whole the richness of that mixture. Uh, it's still very much with us today. You know, so for you know all the people who are arguing about you know we've got to stop you know, legal immigration in this country. We've got to build a wall. I mean, those people are eating Mexican food. They're eating tacos. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a, there's an interchange that's sometimes very, uh, very contentious. But beneath that, there is this harmonious interchange that has infiltrated every aspect of our culture. You know, music, food, literature, you know, everything. So uh, that, I, I think, our relationship with, with Mexico, if I had to sort of single out one sort of constant in, in, the, in the Texas story, that would probably be it. I, I would agree with you on that. What, um, one thing, you mentioned T.R. Fehrenbach's history, uh, 1968, 69, something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, this being the latest uh, we need we need a phrase for a book this size. Epic history of yeah, Texas. Well, what, just well, five pound history. Five history. pound <laughs> history. This is no one pound book. Um, no doubt you're going to catch some flack because yeah. there's nothing. And I and I get some for the podcast when people, you know, Texans love their history so much. And if you don't tell the story that they heard from mm. their grandmother, they are going to give you hell about right. that. Mm -hmm. But do you think that maybe the the whole concept of revisionist history, et cetera, et cetera, is a little bit over discussed? Can, or or how do you feel about that as a non historian writing a history book? Well, do you it, think we just beat that to death <laughs> and just all ought to get along and enjoy it? Well, I think we. I think. I think that we. I didn't have an agenda going into this book. 
I didn't want an agenda. And I freely and enthusiastically and gratefully read all this this new history that's been coming out over the last, say, 20 years that's, that's, that's enlivened the discussion and, and to some people, you know, poisoned the discussion. Right, right. But to me, it was really important. But the, the, the important thing, I think, for me, and I think for any historian, is to not set yourself up in judgment of the people who went before. I mean, would I have been a you know, as progressive or as uh, inclusive or whatever as I th would like to imagine myself to have been if I'd lived in the, you know, if I'd lived in the 1830s or if I'd lived in, you know, the here lived in Texas during the Civil War, during Reconstruction, or during Jim Crow, which I did. I, I was, you know, mm -hmm. as a kid, uh, I wouldn't have been any I, you know, I would have been who I was. I would have been the, the, the sum total of my, you know, experiences and opportunities. And I think, you know, when you say the word revisionism with a kind of, you know, uh, skeptical tone in your voice, I think what you're referring to is, is an effort to subvert everything that went before rather than an honest effort to, to, to inclusively look at at everything that has gone before, to try to to honestly deal with the the conflicts from every side, to to put yourself in the minds and experiences of the, of, of all the participants, and so um, I, I just felt like uh, to me writing a history was in in an odd way the same way as writing a novel in the sense that. When I write a character in a novel, he might be a villain, he might you know, not be a good guy at all, but I'm in his head. Right. You know, I'm not judging this guy, I'm trying to understand his motivations, and that's what, that's what as, a, as a beginner historian, I'm trying to do too. <laughs> well, that's an excellent point of view. All right, the end of every Wise About Texas episode has a segment I call Getting There, where I tell the listener how to go see some of the places I mentioned in the podcast. So I'd like to do, I'd like to conclude with a big, wonderful thing, Texas road trip. Okay. Where should we go? Design, you drove all over the state. Right. In connection uh, with this book. Where would you send us? I would go, uh, I'd go, I'd maybe do it in chronological order. <laughs> I would go to the confluence of the Pecos and Rio Grande, maybe down to Seminole Canyon State Park, and look at some of those pictographs that were painted there as long ago as 4,000 years and just stand there and wonder <laughs> who these people were. You know, Texas has a, we think of it as having a shallow history, you know, going back only a couple hundred years. It goes back so much deeper and we don't know anything about it very much, but, you know, there are 15,000 years probably of, of, of people who, who were here before us, who experienced full lives and, you know, sorrows and joys and everything. And so I, I'm haunted by those people. Um, I would uh, I would go, let me see, to the, I would go, this is not exactly chronological, I would go to Spindletop, which is an underwhelming location. <laughs> if you've ever been there, I mean, there's not, yeah. there ain't much to see, but yeah, you, know, you stand there and you think, well, this is where the world changed, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is where Texas changed. This is where the modern world, arguably, sort of began. Uh, I go to a place like George, President George W. Bush's childhood home in Midland, uh, to see where you know the modest beginnings of two presidents you know, uh, happened, and uh, it's really a remarkable place. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm entranced by that house because it's very, it's very modest. It's very much like the house I grew up in, Abilene, and it sort of is a time capsule of a, of a 1950s West Texas world. Uh, I'd go to the Galleria in Houston, and I don't know the ex exact spot, but I'd think about how... Beyonce as a young girl met Selena Quintanilla here yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and was you know her, she was just inspired to 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 follow in Selena's footsteps and become a great singer. Um, 
you know, so many places I'd love to go to or would love to send people to. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, a vast state with, with a vast history. Well, and it's been captured very well and big, wonderful thing. Thank you so much for agreeing to do the book project. Well, thank and you. <laughs> thank you very much for the time and appearing on Wise About Texas. I'm very delighted to be here, Ken. Thank you. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. You can find the show on Facebook as well as Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. And if you'd like to support the preservation and promotion of Texas history, go to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, slash wiseabouttexas. Steve Harrigan's book, Big Wonderful Thing, is now available, and please let me know what you think of it on Twitter or at host at wiseabouttexas.com. I look forward to your feedback. Go out and do something for Texas today, and until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.